It's half the weight of a standard farm bike at 65 kilograms, including the battery. So you know, in terms of maneuverability, the kind of strength you need to handle the vehicle. You can have someone who's 70, 80 years old, someone who's quite small to someone who's quite big. So, you know, it's pretty flexible in the way that it can be used. Welcome back to another episode of A Kiwi Original. Today on the show, I'm joined by Timothy Allen, who is the Chief Executive Officer for UBCO Bikes, UBCO Bikes, a expert manufacturer in New Zealand of utility electric vehicles. So first of all, welcome to the show, Timothy. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I am really good and really curious about this utility electric vehicle you manufacture. And my my particular question of curiosity is does it compete with a quad bike or a motorbike or have you invented an entirely new category yeah it definitely sits between those two so obviously traditionally a motorcycle because of its structure it can actually make it a little bit difficult to use it in sort of like really utilitarian applications i mean probably the honda ct110 and cx90 were the, probably the bikes that actually ruled the roost in terms of that lightweight functional two-wheeler. Um, they were sort of stopped manufacturing quite a long time ago, so uh, quite prized uh, bikes to have out there. Quads have probably taken over and then UTVs, which are side-by-sides, have taken over from quads. And they're sort of, I guess, the utility vehicles. But you know what, what happens is obviously the ATVs have had the big safety risk very expensive to operate as well and maintain. And then the UTVs are actually even, whilst they have some safety improvements with the roller protection and the seat belt, um, they're also even more expensive to maintain than an ATV. And uh, they're wider and they tend to be bigger. So they don't necessarily suit a lot of farming applications. You know, the, the ATV worked well because it's reasonably narrow can get in uh, a wide variety of situations, just has a bit of a engineering issue with the um, high center of gravity. And uh, I, I know through another um, a New Zealand made license holder who does those roll bars, yep. unlike Australia, there is no regulatory framework that makes those mandatory. So, you know, we're seeing yeah, 20 I mean, something deaths a year in New Zealand that, that yeah. are all preventable. Yeah. Yeah, and ROPs won't fix that because the problem is um, that a ROP depends on you having a seatbelt because if you get ejected from the reason why no Japanese company will sign off to a ROP is that the engineers know that a person will be thrown from the vehicle and a ROP will, in essence, make the accident worse unless, you know, there is obviously, I think, one or two of the New Zealand designs are designed to deform over a user so they won't actually, they will prevent the vehicle from crushing you but not crush you in the process Whereas obviously a rigid rock will definitely, you know, cause you. And one of the principal issues with UTVs is obviously people use them and then don't use the seatbelt, which is exactly the same principal issue. If you're in a car accident and you don't use the seatbelt, you will be ejected from the vehicle. So, and that's far worse than being in the cocoon of a vehicle where you get sort of protected. So it's... It's sort of like I got asked to talk to the Safer Farms group about it and I kind of said, well, it's kind of obvious. Um, so you can wear a helmet if you want, but it's not a helmet problem. It's sort of a, a people mostly get crush injuries, spinal injuries, things like that, which are from the vehicle actually rolling onto them. So, and they, you know, they weigh in at sort of 300 kilograms a piece. That's not the heaviest ones out there. That's sort of an ATV average. Um, so UTVs are heavier again, so they're definitely a pretty dangerous. So we have very low centre of gravity, very lightweight, um, without a sort of heat source. So you know you reduce any potential traditional injury you might get from a two wheeler, and then obviously the subframe and everything's designed to carry weight, and then you have a portable power supply which obviously can be used to recharge um, electrical tools um, that are pretty common these days. And your bikes are, you know, doing a 120 kilometer range, which is is going to suit most farms in New Zealand. And, you know, with a, a max speed of 50 kilometers an hour, there's probably a, a ton of places you can get pretty quickly. How do you how do you then shift that mindset of a farmer who um, doesn't just use the quad bike for uh, getting from A to B, but it's it's a portable workbench, right? It's got all your tools in it. It's the thing you go back to and have a cuppa. It's, it's got all the storage. How much storage is in your bikes? 
Um, storage is actually really not the issue because people are typically, I mean, it was quite interesting actually, Zespri just did a, a very big sort of external study of the use of vehicles in orchards. And I mean, if you look at what they found there, um, I think, you, you know, people are not actually carrying a lot of stuff. I mean, we're doing right. routinely doing things like postal delivery where people are, these guys are carrying like 40 kilograms, you know, and so, you know, you, you don't, um, you can carry most of what you need on these vehicles. Yet there is a mind shift and, you know, over time, I think, you know, people, if they see better and better alternatives in the two wheel space, I think there's a perception that, uh, a four-wheeler is also traditionally automatic, so it's easier to drive than a traditional two-wheel motorcycle. So if you have, there's been a definite influx of, of, I guess, you know, if you want to call it migrant labour into farms in New Zealand. And so those, those might be Filipino farm workers who, you know, have to learn to use a motorcycle. And so using an automatic four-wheel platform that, you know, is basically just a throttle and go, that is easier for them. Um, but obviously, you know, with the two by two, it's, it has no clutch. So it's just a throttle twist and go very, you know, with that low COG and very lightweight, it, it's easy for people to learn. You don't really need to ever have ridden a motorcycle before in your life to learn. That's an interesting shift because I've, um, my dad was a, a avid, um, cyclist. He was part of the Harley owners group and he, he's had all the different bikes throughout his entire life, but somehow that gene missed me and the few times <laughs> I have been on one, although they've usually been in uh, hot, summery, uh, Koh Samui, Thailand islands. Um, every time I've been on one, I've, I've been thrown off it pretty quick. Oh. <laughs> so so would I be able to get on one of the these Ubco bikes and, and stay on it, do you reckon? Yeah, easily, because you can put your feet down. So it's, you know, and, you, you know, it, that, that's part of it is that it's, it's low enough to kind of put your feet down and, and that means that at any point you can sort of stop. So, yeah, and, and again, the it's half the weight of a standard farm bike at 65 kilograms, including the battery. Wow. So, um, you know, in terms of manoeuvrability, the kind of strength you need to handle the vehicle, it's obviously all, you know, it, you, you can have someone who's 70, 80 years old uh, and you know, someone who's quite small to someone who's quite big. So, you know, it's pretty flexible in the way that it can be used. Yeah, it will be. I mean, I think we see every year the products improved and we've got better and better in, in this sort of rural environment. It's a very tough environment to operate in because it's every day of the year, um, which, you know, it's the hard. If we sell to a recreational consumer in the States, I mean, you, you know, they might do something to a bike in five years at one of these guys in New Zealand will do in like a couple of months so yeah it's every day of the year rain hail or sunshine and in pretty hard circumstances so you know we've been forced to iterate the vehicle really um, quickly uh, we're probably we're in the fifth generation sort of production vehicle at the moment that one's just about to come out and um, yeah so I think that's um, that's got a lot of promise and I think it answers a lot of the questions that say we might have been asked over time in the in the actual use of the vehicle on farm. So, you know, really looking forward to those landing in New Zealand and, and getting them into the farmer's hands. Let's now move uh, into the, the city side of things. You yeah. recently um, have had some success in uh, rolling out bikes for dominoes yeah um what were some of the questions that uh, they had in terms of um unblocking the barriers for them to be confident to roll this out to you know their courier drivers that are going to be delivering dozens of pizzas a night with lots of small trips over you know in greater iteration yeah well they i mean they'll do these the bikes and they'll do about twenty thousand kilometers a year but it is above ground on asphalt and so it's not covered in mud and effluent and it's not rugged ground so if you want to look at the duty cycle and the fatigue of say a bike in that context um it's, it's much less than what you would have in a rural agricultural setting so um, everything that we've done to improve the vehicle from an agricultural standpoint has a benefit in an urban standpoint like that because it is a high duty application, uh, seven days a week, probably three, you know, maybe two to three shifts a day. Um, they're doing five deliveries an hour, probably five kilometre round trips. So, yeah, it's a 20,000 kilometre a year 
you know, usage. Um, and we probably had bikes in trial for six months. Then we started doing sort of rollouts from there, and then it's ratcheted it up this year with the growth in deliveries as well. And then internationally, because of the growth in deliveries across the board, there's a lot of opportunities in that space. And obviously what we have is an integrated technology stack. So you've developed the hardware, firmware, and software layers. Um, so we can give Domino's a look in at what all those vehicles are doing. We can see sitting in our office here, the battery level of all the vehicles in each store, where they are in each store, how many trips per hour they're doing and um, all of that sort of stuff. And then, you know, that's really just scratching the tip of the iceberg because, um, you know, because we have a full look through the vehicle and the battery, uh, you know, any sensor or any kind of electrical control that we have in the system can be kind of essentially pulled out or polled um, and we can look at that information if we wanted to. We obviously poll just what we need, you know, so it's typically kind of, you know, things like location, battery level, sort of those types of things at the moment. But obviously, you know, that becomes more and more in depth over time. So does that get you into then the the fleet management space where, you know, essentially you could integrate what you can see in the data to a Domino's API and give them either fleet management or you could do it on yeah, their so we behalf? Already, we already give them fleet management overview. So they have a login to the fleet portal um, that has all their vehicles in it and that sort of has a hierarchy so if you're a franchise or an operator for the corporate side um, you can see the stores that you might own or have responsibility for and then let's say there's five or ten vehicles in that you'll see that but then the corporate guys um, can get a full overview of the whole thing and report on the whole fleet so yeah i mean we were already sort of essentially in that space um, not not just in um, food delivery, but obviously, you know, these are sorts of things I can very much see being rolled into agriculture at a sort of corporate level um, because health and safety, again, you know, we've got sensors on the vehicle, which mean that you could send alert triggers of a vehicle is, is essentially incurs uh, an incident at above a certain level of G-force and then the vehicle, according to the gyro, says it's not, it's no longer standing up. So you would know that somebody's had, had some form of accident. Um, you can also do driver behaviour and safety stuff as well. So if someone's, you know, driving erratically or things like that, I mean, you know, we are bringing in with our new vehicle almost like a parental control system. So, you know, in effect, if you're a farm manager and you lock down those 10 vehicles, they may be speed limited to 35 kilometres an hour and have limited acceleration compared to what you have got available. Because, you know, if you're just using a bike on farm as transport, um, you know, you don't have to be the equivalent of it and Senna around the sort of uh, dairy <laughs> races, you know, because speed and acceleration will all just increase wear and tear. So if they decrease that, then, you know, it just means A, it's safer and B, you know, it's, less li it's likely to lower any kind of servicing burden that you might create, which is unnecessary. And what are the the things that you have to learn when you're shifting across from, you know, gas, petrol powered across to uh, electric? You've got this uh, UBCO University. What are the things that you learn through that university that maybe even if you're an expert at riding a motorbike, you might not? Um... Yeah, well, the, the uni is pretty sort of all encompassing. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine, we need to be able to um, fluidly train service agents globally. So we can train uh, service agents now in a digitally certified way to kind of what we would call level two technical. And that means that they that, that would be equivalent to a dealer's mechanic. Um, and then for the end consumer, what we have is like a whole bunch of different things that are coming in, like, you know, the different kind of racks you can use. And it just talks you through how you can set the bike up to carry it in your vehicle few different ways um, it covers things like the use of solar flexible and rigid PV it covers stuff like um, how to set your bike up initially so we have a five-step system of stickers we have approved from NZTA to ship bikes directly to an end consumer with an MR2A so they can get it registered so we're on a few companies that can do that Wow and that's based on the fact that we have a, an established system the bike is fully assembled in cardboard so you know, we can ship it to someone's house. You can be a non-technical user. 
and we include the tools. And then very shortly, actually, in production, we're just about to finish um, a tool kit, which actually gets mounted underneath the seat that goes out with every bike. And that's a really cleverly designed um, system that has pretty much uh, everything that you would need to do on the bike. It's got you covered, you know, mostly. So it's you need to make all the adjustments to a bike, pretty much these multi-tools will do all of that work for you. So would that help uh, some of your ambassadors, for example, um, Tom Herzog, I think it is, an adventurer that, that hails yeah. from Seattle and he goes on these yeah, you know, massive long trips. Yeah, the concern I would have with that is I'd, I'd want my petrol with me because I know in America I can get it everywhere. These, these guys are pretty used to doing stuff for themselves. And so, you know, PV is definitely becoming more kind of um, – common in the sort of overlanding community where you know we have a footprint in both the us and australia in that sort of area and so you know there is a general kind of concession that it's it's better than you know having solar gives you a lot of flexibility if you're out in the middle of nowhere um so you know i mean look we've got a pretty big pack so you know uh a kind of proper setup could take you know six to eight hours to charge a battery um but that would be the same if it was plugged in so at, you know we have a fast charger at 10 amps now that will probably do it in six hours depending on the size of the battery we've got two new battery sizes um this year going up to 3.1 kilowatts so it just takes it will take a bit more time to charge those up so yeah i mean it's uh, definitely for those guys if you were in oregon and you you know there's a there's more trails than you can ride in a lifetime in Eastern Oregon. Um, you know, having a toolkit that's optimized to sort of get you covered if you need to do an emergency fix or something like that, if you're out or adjust something, that's kind of handy. And it's really nicely done. It's sort of um, protected underneath the seat in a waterproof zip sort of enclosure. And then you have your user manual in there as well, which has, you know, um, Interestingly, well, actually, I've got one here. Um, you know, it's uh, this little guy, mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole lot of New Zealand sort of things in there. Like, it actually has a lot of little references to New Zealand. Each one of these, you know, it explains cool. what it is. So it has all this endemic little section headers, you know, whether it's sort of a Cody or a Kiwi or a Tuatara. And this this is just blended. And we've had a lot more interest in people internationally about, you know, where Upco's from nowadays from when we first started. Probably when we first started, we are a little bit apprehensive or careful. And, you know, you try and position the vehicle as being something that they use for themselves in the US, whereas now, you know, there's much more of an interest and a demand to know about where we're from. And That's interesting. What what do you think's caused that shift? Is that something that you've been more confident to talk about where you're from? Um, or it's hard to say, really. I mean, it's been pretty organic. I'm I'm not exactly sure what the driving reason is, but you know, it's definitely there. And people, I guess, New Zealanders as a country, the profile of the country's sort of developed over time and it's quite, um, people do tend to like New Zealand and things from New Zealand. So it adds to the credibility of the brand. And yeah, so I think, and probably there is an element of maybe there is more confidence to actually talk about it. Um, so yeah, it's probably a combination of things. I think um, also what you're manufacturing works well with some of our natural attributes, right? Which is yeah, that's right. We've yeah. we've got this wilderness that we need to get out into. Okay, how are we going to do it? Oh, here's someone that's built something for their wilderness. Well, we've got a wilderness in America or in Europe. It's got to be good if it works in New Zealand, right? So yeah, definitely. There's there's definitely an element of that, and I think utility side. I think New Zealanders are generally regarded as um, you know practical so um there's you know the utility practical side of it kind of fits um if you look at the stories that we've built around new zealand users like um not necessarily completely intentionally but but obviously you know where some of these people use their bikes are beautiful places and so if you see some of these stories i mean they're very 
panoramic and interesting. And so, again, it's all sort of woven into the kind of brand DNA. I mean, it doesn't mean that, like, we we have some kind of cool users which are all over the show and we're still, like, very keen to tell their stories. Um, but obviously, you know, for us to tell a story in New Zealand, it's kind of doable. <laughs> it's, it's quite easy to do. So it's a lot easier for us to like build a great video story, whether it be the Defence Force or Dominoes or, you know, a hunter down in the uh, East Coast or something like that. It's pretty easy to tell those stories. I'm glad you mentioned that last one because I um, that was one that that uh, stood out for me was I think his name's uh, Owen Boynton. He's yeah, that's right. He's, a, right. he's, yeah. he's got like two and a half thousand uh, acres that he hunts on. He talks about your bike being his stealthier friend that doesn't complain about having to carry everything and if you can get closer to the um if you can get the animals closer to camp then why wouldn't you and, yeah and that yeah. word kept on coming up as stealthier as a description of your bike because it's completely silent right yeah it's very quiet like i think you know i wouldn't say it's completely silent but um at low speed it is you know you principally would hear the the wheels contact with the ground and then um as you get up a bit you can get it you know there is obviously a de sort of detectable word but to be fair by comparison to a combustion en engine vehicle quiet as a it's an easy reach um and you know so you definitely can get a lot closer to where you want to go from a hunting perspective if you're going to use it but also even uh that applies to people who are just in the workplace so if you like we had a guy who was working on a strip grazing farm in Southland, you know, when we first got going and he had a bike and, you know, he, he said it's just sort of like it was a bit of a revelation for him because he, he has to be on a vehicle six or seven hours a day and the, the drone of the motor just grinds you down. Right. Mm. So he's just like, man, it's just such a relief. Um, and it feels like you're walking around and you can hear your surroundings and your environment. And I think that's, something that you don't necessarily think of when you're developing a product like this but once people start using it that comes through quite strongly as like a really great and positive attribute i've experienced that personally and uh, you know it wasn't an intended uh, outcome but um, i was in norway and, and hired a tesla to to get between a couple of different mountain ranges that we were up exploring and Admittedly, they're in the middle of nowhere, so I had a bit of range anxiety about how we're going to charge this thing at a at a restaurant hotel that was built in the the late eighteen hundreds. But we we found a way. Um, but yeah, after driving six or eight hours, I, I didn't have that same tiredness profile, and and I thought maybe it's some of it's because of the the roading. It's there's got smoother roads. But it's partly the sound. Uh, you're in this quiet, uh, quiet vehicle. So I can imagine the same thing goes for an electric bike. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, that even when you go to Domino's or someone like that, I mean, obviously these guys, if you're knocking about, in, you know, neighborhoods in the evening in a two stroke, it's not exactly that great. So having something that's quieter that gets around it, it's, it appeals to them from that perspective as well. And then you get through to these other applications like uh, an NZDF or something like that. Obviously, for them, you know, quiet is good uh, in terms of what they're doing in terms of reconnaissance, reconnaissance and things like that that they want to use the bike for. So, yeah, all in all, um, it's one of those things that an electric vehicle... Um, I mean, they, you periodically hear people talking about the application of artificial noise to vehicles, which, you know, I don't, I'm not a proponent of because it's... It's one of those things where people do get used to it. It's I don't personally think road noise changes whether or not someone's going to not walk out in front of a car or a bus or something like that. It happens all the time. Um, so I don't necessarily think that it's um, that it's necessary. Um, certainly not off road. Off road, there's you know it would be hard to think of a valuable case where you would create artificial noise deliberately to a vehicle that's quiet. I completely agree. And I think with the intelligence in vehicles, uh, ultimately the onus will be on the vehicle partially and the vehicle owner to make sure you don't hit people. And you can do that through technology. Yeah, that's, um, yeah absolutely. So, I mean, you know, if you look at the modern technology with vehicles, it's there's, there's massive advances in that, which um, 
even with what we're talking about doing, you know, as you develop new vehicles, um, all the sensor technology and everything that's there now, you know, we'll integrate more and more of that to kind of give, uh, you know, more safety profile. And, you know, like the thing about things like safety on farm is that it is, you're dealing with sort of human behaviour and it's very difficult to change that. So we've really taken a more preventative approach to this as an idea. And I mean, if people, if someone's not going to use their seatbelt, I can't, no matter what sensors you jam in the vehicle, people will find workarounds and they do today. So you've got to think beyond that and think, okay, well, how can the vehicle work predictively in a work mode? Uh, you still kind of need to provide a mode which allows someone, you know, if someone wants to use the vehicle recreationally, um, you know, shoot. I like doing things in the weekend that are at times dangerous and that's my choice. So I don't particularly want someone clamping down on those. So you still kind of need to give people the option. But I think principally with farm safety, it's someone should have the ability to come back from work. And so having a vehicle that can be put into work mode increases that and decreases the risks uh, from a safety point of view and whether that's the vehicle saying I don't like this position because you, you you know you, these vehicles you, you can be calculating at thousands of times a second and it's not going to be distracted in the same way that a human is so you know you might be thinking about what you're doing tonight and you just don't notice what you're doing a little bit and you end up in the wrong place whereas a vehicle like that can just go actually this is not good I'm going to warn you and get your attention back and then I'm going to stop because I don't like what's going on. So all of those sort of, you know, approaches in future, that's where you can make the really, you know, demonstrable improvements in farm safety because it is one of those areas. And also standards, uh, safety and things like that. I mean, there's a lot of um, people don't, like the misunderstanding about the use of ROPs is really obvious to me, but you listen to pretty educated people talking about it like, they don't really understand why you can't have one on an ATV and why it doesn't make sense. Unless it's one of those, you know, special, I know there's a, there's a particular New Zealand design that has that capability to deform. Yeah. But, you know, and, but it is at the end of the day, it's an engineering issue where the vehicle ultimately has too high a center of gravity. So, you know, you can deal with that with the vehicle design and engineering being different. And then you can also deal with the preventative part by having more technology on board, which sort of can help to make sort of uh, onboard judgments about kind of whether something is going to be okay or not okay. How much um, of the software stack that, that interfaces with these sensors that provides you the intelligence coming back from the bike, uh, how much of that software is, is coded in Tauranga, New Zealand? Um, all of our hardware, firmware and software is done in New Zealand. Um, we have probably most of the, let's call them the technology team are based actually in Auckland. So that's kind of hardware and firmware and software. Um, most of the physical stuff is done here. So that's kind of your uh, mechanical engineering, testing, validation. Um, here we've got a sort of, you know, two floors of this building and one floor is basically R&D and the other one's sort of sales marketing administration. So, yeah, I mean, it's all done in New Zealand. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of talented people in New Zealand in those fields, so I don't think at this stage we don't really have any capacity constraints unless we wanted to make a lunar rover or something. <laughs> but, um, yeah, most of what we can do, you know, we've got, People are very, very good and, you know, we've made huge strides in the last, say, you know, 24 months from a technology standpoint and, and both a battery level at a vehicle and vehicle management level communications and then, you know, this whole sort of fleet management concept. So that whole stack's really become much, much more refined. What makes it possible to to manufacture something which is a you know a high, usually a high volume, high cost good, right? So, um, you have to your manufacture week. in the, the millions to get your, your return your, on investment. Um, yes and no. I mean, it's to some degree, you know, obviously that's the opportunity um, to manufacture in that volume. But um, obviously you have to be a pretty established company to get to that point. 
Um, yeah, certainly our desire is to get into the tens of thousands of vehicles per annum, um, which would mean that you know we can do things that perhaps we can't do today. But we, I mean, we have a global supply chain. I mean, I think you have to acknowledge that. Um, you know, there are very specialised parts with very specialised manufacturers that we select and use. Um, you know, for very particular reasons, and so I think over time, you, you know, definitely as a company, you probably manufacture more strategic parts internally. But we do use, I mean, all of our PCBA, which is all the high tech, very intelligent kind of parts, the the brains of both the vehicle and, and, and the battery systems, they're all made in Auckland. Um, and then they're actually um, cased and exported um, onto line. So we still use the bike manufacturing industry in Taiwan um, because it's important that we can. So we have, you know, Taiwanese staff, we've got New Zealand staff, and then we have, you know, the, the, obviously the sales and marketing teams in an international capacity in, in the US, EU, Australia. Um, so... It's quite distributed, um, but yeah, all of your development, testing, and, and very sensitive stuff is made here. And you know, if you get into a conversation with the likes of defence guys, I mean, it's a pretty easy answer, right? I mean, they they want that stuff locked down, and you can offer that to them. Um, so that's that's a real advantage, obviously, because you know it gives them a lot of comfort if we've got a a high uh, highly credited, you know, sort of, um, you know, PCBA manufacturing environment in New Zealand that we can leverage to support, um, you know, the product. Because obviously, they'll, they'll, they won't be too concerned about, you know, where a tyre comes from. Um, but obviously, if, you, if all of your comms and electronic control come from somewhere else, they might be a bit more worried. That's not the first time I've encountered or have heard that either, is that... Uh... You know, that intellectual property, that intangible part, um, if an organization decides to partner with one country and one set of values, it sometimes will immediately exclude them from an opposing country. Uh, because if you choose one, you're actually sharing your intellectual property with that defense force and each defense force wants a strategic advantage, right? Um, I think last... mostly what the, they'll be principally concerned about it is it's really sort of, you know, I guess, security around what you're doing. So New Zealand is seen as safe. Um, so manufacturing your high-tech components here is seen as very acceptable. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a very good thing. And, yep, you, you know, we do pay more for the privilege, but at the end of the day, you know, there are some intrinsic benefits of proximity, you know, control, relationships, uh, even through to an accounting side, it's easier to deal with uh, New Zealand than it is other countries. What got you started down this path, Timothy? Because there's there's a number of parts to this, and they're all hard. Mm. Um, you know, a vehicle production is hard. Something that is electric is hard, and then something that has software development is is hard as well and you've got all three together yeah and then you're also selling both to consumer and business and yeah. government um how did you begin with this business yeah so my background um i mean i started out sort of fine art scholastic and then i sort of got into design did a product design degree by the time i finished that i was more interested in r d than product design from a pure design standpoint. And so kind of first job I had out of school was working at Te Papa when it was being built, um, working on the big exhibitions, natural history ones, um, mountains to the sea and the geological exhibits and some of the other specialized type five cases that are there for the irreplaceable objects. And then I um, came up to Tauranga to work for a manufacturer, built a design team there and then started a product development company five years after that mainly focused on R&D and did that for sort of probably 15 years. Um, and we were making investments into companies. Arbco was one of the ones we invested into. Um, and then I got more sort of substantially involved and then ended up sort of taking the role to run the company in about the middle of 2016. And 
yeah, I mean, look, it was probably natural evolution. So it's probably the same reason that I went from art to design, design to R&D, R&D. I was always, I was interested in the commercial stuff mainly because you have to be involved with it to get stuff through. Because you can have the best design in the world, but it doesn't mean that people know how to get it through commercially. And it's, you know, when you consider the amount of effort invested into a significant development, um, it's always pretty disappointing if someone can't deliver on the commercial side. Um, so, you know, I guess for this one, it was an opportunity to actually take, you know, take what I've learned and apply that. So if you look at, you know, I've worked across sort of aerospace, medical devices, construction, sporting and equipment, a whole lot of different fields, primary sector. And so, you know, product development gives you a pretty broad seating, uh, which is, it is useful for the kind of role that I have. And um, obviously, it gives you also a lot of contacts and connections. So, I mean, in order to do UPCO, you have to be connected to enough people that know how to get shit done. And, and those people need to be prepared to, you know, um, step up and, and want to be a part of it. So, you know, that's something that, you know, it's probably, I've worked with a lot of people over an extended period of time. So, you kind of know the people that can probably do things at the right level. So we've been super lucky to have our our CTO, Rob Beck, who's a really, you know, talented guys, uh, you know, l packing a lot into one person in terms of hardware, software and firmware. And, and he sort of held, held us together from a pure technology standpoint up until this point. We've only just really got to a point where we've got other people coming in and, and helping him do what we need to do. And so, you know, again, I think Sir Paul Callaghan said that New Zealand does have pretty good physical applied technology. So that's kind of the stuff that we do. Um, I think New Zealand is reasonably good at it. If you looked at it against other countries um, and, you know, generally speaking, pretty resourceful. So you can do things quicker and perhaps in a more straight line. And, you know, there is the other aspect that some of the commercial applications, like in the States, I mean, you wouldn't get some of the things that occur with us, which is, you know, someone reads an article, he's like runs dominant, you know, like Cameron Toomey is a GM for Domino's New Zealand, reads an article on a plane and he just calls me and go, oh, can I come down tomorrow? And going, yeah, sure, it sounds good. Um, that's kind of pretty New Zealand. So it means you can wrote, you, you tend to be able to, you know, learn about an application very quickly. Defence Force is another one. If you try to do defence in the States, I mean, you'd be, you'd be in there for a long queue. Whereas, you know, this, again, it's like you get sort of Lieutenant Colonel Bradley Gallup ring up and say, we're interested in coming up. How does tomorrow sound? And you're going, oh, yeah, sure. And then you start a bit of a chat about it and then get a couple of guys come down to a conference and then you're putting a program together and then next thing you know, these guys have actually got the bikes and have them out in the field doing stuff with them. So it's pretty advantageous because there aren't a lot of barriers to actually getting things done. So, you know, it means that we can show somebody in an international context, hey, you know what, we can actually deliver food and we've been doing it for 24 months and here are the numbers. So that that's super helpful. Um, you know, we've had presentations through our sales guys to some pretty big international corporates now, and you know, some of them are like, "Well, shit, nobody else is doing that." Um, not not in such a integrated way. I mean, you have companies that will bring elements together, but there's very few companies out there doing what we've done in the spaces we're operating in at the moment. And I think the rural stuff is really interesting because. It's kind of one of those ones where it goes from, you know, why would you to all of a sudden, why wouldn't you? And once you've got to the why wouldn't you, but it's actually hard to chase it down because you're already kind of bolted. So even if you're a really big OEM, I mean, you know, we've presented sequentially at the field day since 2014, 15, and, you know, every year they turn up with the same products. And so, you know, you've gone from like, a basic off-road product to then a fully vehicle management, you know, ECU control, Bluetooth, on-road certified product and off-road. And then if you look at what we've got now, it's full portable power, Bluetooth 5, G GPS, gyro, you know, they've got the whole nine yards. And so it's like you, you're just every year, it's you're just putting another marker down. And so you just keep your pace on and 
I think that's that's the way to to deal with the threat of the big guys is you just keep sprinting. Hey, just a quick interruption. Thanks for watching a Kiwi original. If you're liking this episode, then hit the notification button, and that means you'll see when every new episode gets released. We've done 40 already. We've got another 50 lined up. Right now, back to the episode. I, that's exactly what I saw through a tweet from Elon Musk, and uh, I was talking about um, what Ford has done in the time that Elon Musk has manufactured and sent a Tesla into space, they've managed to put a foot activated boot opener or trunk opener on their Ford range. And they're, they're just different uh, they also, innovation curves. Yeah. And I think with electric vehicles, you know, you've got to think holistically about it because that's the, the, the real opportunity is, um, you know, it, it's going from an analog system to a completely digital system. And I think where they started to realize, like they went from sort of thinking they had it covered and these guys were just, you know, halfwits to suddenly realizing that, you know, you've now got the head of Volkswagen and said, you know, basically we have a three year technology deficit, you know, to these guys, like they can't bridge it as software because, you know, what they are not, even, you know, when you talk to people in the States about the, the autonomous driving things, Waymo was always regarded as, basically the most advanced which is google's program but i was always like well yeah but the problem is that these guys are collecting data on a person driving plus they've got all the sensors on board and they're doing that 24 hours a day millions of kilometers and so they can even i imagine they'll be running things okay well if a human did this and our system did that how can we get it to do that not what it did correct it and so they collect a huge amount of data and so you know that so you know you'd be a gambling person to think that you know like the Waymo would actually beat Tesla because again the vertical integration with the vehicle and the whole software control of the vehicle it's much more plausible despite the you know the size of Alphabet um, that probably, you know, Tesla will basically succeed. I mean, what the big companies like um, Alphabet slash Google are looking for is essentially becoming the operating system of a car, which then means that GM is essentially just a manufacturer, like if you made an Android handset, which is a bit of a fall if you're brands like that. But, I mean, if you look at the market cap of Tesla relative to the other companies now, I mean, that's kind of... That's the market perception um, is that, you know, they've, again, they're, they're putting together all the technology in a similar way to probably what, you know, Steve Jobs is very good at. It's kind of like actually connecting the, the whole picture. Um, I mean, probably from us, I mean, we're not necessarily, <laughs> we haven't got quite the access to funding that some of those fellas have got, but, um, you know, Again, you can already see the difference in when you go up against certain vehicles because we're taking a holistic approach. Um, it's already quite strongly differentiating and it does tend to be, it is probably compounding because again, like, you know, you've now got 50 vehicles and you're learning from them every day and then that's suddenly 200 and then that's 2,000 and then our R&D gets better, the product gets better, and it's, you know, so again, it is it's it is compounding. Um, but it has to be attached to, like, you know, pretty aggressive development, like, you, you know, make no mistake about it. You can't be timid about it because if you are, it's such a fast-moving field that you've sort of got to choose your lines and, and, and move very quickly against them. Um, so, you know, we're always sort of feeling slightly or greatly under resourced for what we do um but you know you're always pushing hard to get get through to a point where you're proving it and i think we're probably at the point now where the maturity of the vehicle platform relative to the technology that's integrated inside of it is at that sort of you know it's probably just at the tipping point again when you go into applications like the, the few things that that we might have that you know, perhaps you didn't like in, say, food delivery context and now dealt with um, the, 
95% of the things that you might see in an agricultural domain that you kind of want to deal with have been dealt with. And so you're sort of getting through to a point that, you know, it's reasonably mature. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, we'll take the foot off, but it just means that, the you know, when people start to test the f these fifth generation vehicles that, you know, if someone was asking a question, you know, we've gone from early adopters and suddenly you're kind of more applicable to a mainstream consumer, which is obviously where the lion's share of the market sits. And some of the cost um, things, you know, there are some challenges around that stuff because, you know, we're making, it's not a cheap vehicle, um, but it's a bit, I've said to our sales guys, look, this is a bit like um, if you bought a Nokia handset, um, you know, if someone had said to you at that point, would you pay $2,000 for a cell phone? You would have said, get the hell out of here. Um, but, you know, because of all the applied functionality that's in a modern smartphone, people are pretty happy to part with it. And so, you know, those are the sorts of things like when you look at a vehicle now with all the additional sensors, with uh, portable power, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you've got the equivalent of 3K generator um, on, on board in the vehicle that you can use for powering other devices, things like that. And that's, that's, that's a $5,000 product if you just go and buy it cold. So, you know, um, you start to sort of, you've got to add the value in and then make sure that the price, you know, the price that you're putting it out at is, is not, I mean, we're not aiming to be the cheapest, but even though we're more expensive in these high duty applications like food delivery, uh, if you replace a combustion engine vehicle, um, you, you are actually probably one to two thousand dollars better off after two years. Really? It's got a yeah. 24 month ROI net present value on it. Fuel, fuel use. Whew. Wow. And then Just around town. the better our maintenance profile gets, then the maintenance drops. Because that's where some of the big gains has come from. It's like the maintenance profile is going to just keep producing. And, um, you know, once you get it to a certain point, I mean, maintenance is going to be, you know, it, it will always have to be there in an everyday year application. It's just mechanical things break down. It's a fact. You can't foresee. I mean, we have someone sort of rings you up from, North Dakota and says their bike's not working and then, you, you know, Rob looks at the bemister and the battery and he said, well, that's because it's fucking negative 20. Um, so it's <laughs> like, yeah, there's a bit of that stuff, you know, people start to use vehicles and so there's always going to be maintenance, but, you know, we can keep on bringing it down, which reduces the cost of ownership. Um, the, the, the electric vehicle side of it is a bit of a no-brainer because, relative to the cost of fuel, a battery is a bit like prepaying your fuel two years in advance. And so like, that's why we've got into subscription because it's sort of saying, well, hmm. you know, acknowledge the truth here is that this is like prepaying your fuel in advance. So why not subscribe to a battery instead of buying it outside uh, up front? So if, if you're at that stage and you've got that market fit, that's, you know, 95% there for, for courier, defense, uh, farms, uh, it's not necessarily capital or investment you need. You just need half a dozen big contracts where they want to buy no, you know, a couple, still, of, no, couple you of thousand still, bikes, surely. Drive inventory growth, you still have to have both working capital, debt and equity and a lot of it. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, the I mean, ultimately, we, you know, our goal is to push through to a listing so you've got proper access to capital because then you can scale at the level of actually what's possible. So at the moment, you're definitely constrained to what you can do. You can never gear enough in front of what you're doing because keep in mind, whatever looks like a big opportunity today is one one hundredth of what's possible tomorrow because the market penetration of, say, electric vehicles today, it's still, despite the news releases, it's mm, still a fraction. Tiny. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, there's like something like 129 million vehicles consumed per annum or manufactured per annum. So, you know, it's a lot. So, yeah, I mean, you access to capital, you've got to be very, you know, we're, we're pretty much working on capital plans the whole time, have been since we first started. And it, it will, you know, I think Rod Drury, when he was working on Zero, some people don't agree with the philosophy, but, you know, he was really clear about that their what they were going to do and how they were going to do it. 
and you know if you invested in them you would have done exceptionally well through their strategy much better than if you'd invested in a blue chip i mean I, one of our investors invested in zero at a dollar sold out at 51 so it's like you can't complain i said to him shit i'm not sure we'll be able to deliver that sort of return for you Stu. but um we'll do our best but it's yeah i mean it's it is a capital intensive um you know business and what we've got to do is you know how we attract capital is obviously by you know increasingly i mean i guess we've started out with early adopter consumers and as you accumulate more proof, then suddenly some of the bigger like enterprise opportunities then start to become available because there's a bit more proof. Um, and obviously that then helps to actually, weirdly, that also promotes uh, consumer sales because people see the vehicles more often. I mean, it'd be- uh, That's where I see this sitting is that, uh, you know, why wouldn't you, if you were a, a listed energy company who currently invests solely in utes and vans and trucks, mm. why wouldn't you augment it with, you know, five percent of your fleet is electric bikes, and then it's yeah. maybe ten or fifteen percent, or there's around particular areas where that makes sense. You maybe have a hundred percent penetration for particular use cases around New Zealand. Yeah, and look, I mean, we've always taken a pretty agnostic view on applications. I mean, you know, we have uh, a really interesting project, which one of the guys has done recently, and he's dug into and summarised where most of the vehicles sold in New Zealand have gone. You can't track everyone, but, you know, he's probably managed to kind of broadly chop 80% of the sales. And when you look at the cross section, that's very broad. And um, you know, you got everything from tourism, conservation, filmmaking. And I think, like, I quite like that. I mean, you get some people that sort of want you to be sort of super laser focused on one thing, and some people think, hey, selling to Domino's cheapens the brand. And you know, three wise men collaboration is kind of where we need to be. But you know, I the thing is, you can do both. I don't necessarily think that they're mutually exclusive and uh, I think for us like it's part of our brand DNA to have that kind of diversity and you know our sort of if you want to call it our mission of this uh, concept of power your purpose is that it's quite cool whether it's Tom Herzog this guy in Washington State or you know who's doing his overlanding or whether it's Toa doing his hunting or whether it's you know Glenn Riley down south on um, doing the conservation for Naita, who, you know, these people are doing what they love doing. And if the bike can, and the products that we make can play a part in that, that's kind of a really nice thing to see. Um, and yeah, so, you know, hopefully we can sort of build on that and continue to grow the range of applications. Because again, one of the interesting things about something like the Honda. 90 is that it was used by all sorts of different people for all sorts of different things um and you know they've got this classic one of the reasons why we got us investment was because bob relson who was um the guy that really sort of kicked it off with us in, in the us he you know saw the connection between he loved the honda trail 90 and he saw the connection between what we were doing and that as a concept and immediately clicked um, so, you know, there's definitely that um, idea that it's interesting to see what people can do with it. And it's very capable. I mean, you'll get some people that say, I can't do this. Um, but, you know, it, maybe it doesn't do it exactly the way that another vehicle does it. But, you know, the tracks that I've ridden and the places that, you know, you've taken the bike here and internationally, I mean, it's, you know, it survived anything from the Sahara Desert to the kind of, you know, northern hemisphere, deep, deep winter sort of territory. So it's done the full stack. Um, New Zealand's still the hardest place to, to, to <laughs> run a bike. And probably a dairy farm is uh, currently tops the roost as the hardest users we have on record, but they keep us honest. What would it mean once you've achieved or started to achieve some of this this scale um, and, you know, assuming that your capital growth keeps pace with the the sales of the UBCO bikes, 
Um, what will it mean for uh, what you need in terms of the, of the rest of New Zealand manufacturing? Are there other kind of feeder industries that you will need to rely on to scale up? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Um, I think so. I mean, probably like we already have a few exotic requests. <laughs> you get into batteries and things like that and you know, all of a sudden somebody wants a 0.18 of a millimetre nickel plate to make some fusing from and, you know, the cool thing about that is, you know, we went looking for that and it turns out Rocket Labs had bought a bunch and so, you know, they let us draw in their stock. So, you know, that was helpful. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's definitely electronic um, manufacturing because running SMT lines and things like that, you could, probably could do it, but, you know, having someone like Rob on board, um means that you know he's probably seen companies internalize it seen companies have it as external and seen the difference and they ask the sort of plants that you've got to keep busy and so we're probably still better off working with companies to do it until you got to a certain scale um, and yeah I think probably it's a good idea uh, we'd probably I can see us having sort of quite close linkages to Taiwan and, you know, sharing resources and technology and ways of doing things. Um, I think our master assembler is going to send when they're able to some people down to, down to us because he's quite interested in, in, I guess, how we do some of the work we do um, because, you know, their guys don't have experience in some of the areas that we're built experience. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, physical kind of manufacturing, it, it probably is. I mean, it is It is probably like those skill sets that you probably would need now since it is probably, you know, fabrication. It would be electronics. It's, it's sort of stuff like that. And there's, there are companies we've talked to, I mean, even in the frame manufacturing space, which is, you know, that that's something that can actually be fully automated and you just need the right volume. Um, and it can be robotic, which means it's kind of labor neutral, which, you know, means say in New Zealand, it's, it's actually feasible. Um, if you look at motors, you've got the likes of Fisher and Paykel uh, appliances that are already a world leader in the manufacturing of, you know, kind of compact, um, you know, it's like you go, you, you look at a, a, a washing machine and, that bloody, that's like a 600 watt motor that's fully submerged and is running for more than 10 years, right? So it's like, there's some good technology these guys have got on there. So yeah, you probably need, um, and I possibly, you know, because there's a limited number of larger companies, I mean, you can definitely offer an alternative um, to some of the more traditional routes, which might, you know, there's probably a lot of a lot of um, people get trained through the likes of Fish and Pockle Appliances and healthcare and engineering companies like that. Um, so I'm sure Rocket Labs is, again, probably another, you know, company that will probably add a lot of capability to New Zealand because um, of the people that they're bringing on and training and then those people, you know, may want to go and do something else at some point in time. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say exactly, but certainly development resources will be probably the first thing we need to drive here. Um, we're probably way, way off stretching, say, the um, PCBA manufacturing capability in New Zealand. But, again, you, you know, it's hard to say. Some of the stuff does move reasonably quickly. So, you know, I mean, if we get the opportunity to move more quickly than what we do, we certainly won't be waiting around. Well, look, it's great to hear your story with Obco Bikes, Timothy, and um, just to hear all the different moving parts that you're having to juggle and assess along the way and thinking about the end customer and the use cases across all of these different areas. And I, I like that you've got such a clear um, clear proposition of what the value set is for the bike, that it is inclusive. You're not trying to niche it down and be one thing for one customer. It's a it's a utility that people can adapt to the way that they live or the, the way they work or the way they want to present themselves uh, as a, a, trans, a, trans, a mode of transport. And that there's all this intelligence with it that even after doing, you know, my, my research before this interview is, 
wasn't that apparent of just how far you've gone down the um, the the route of being able to interrogate each individual bike, how it's operating, uh, what's happening with it to both protect the rider, but also to bring intelligence back to that headquarters or that defense headquarters. There's some huge opportunities with that. So uh, I'm really uh, going to be uh, watching with interest where your organization goes over the next few years. And uh, hopefully it does need to plug into the New Zealand manufacturing scene. I know through some of the previous interviews, uh, you picked up on Rocket Labs. There are other organizations like uh, EasyVet or um, Dawn Aerospace that are also contributing into this ecosystem of software, firmware, hardware. And wouldn't it be great if we got to a critical mass where uh, as one developer wanted to further their career in a different way, they left to another local manufacturer rather than offshore to get a different set of uh, experiences. So for what you're doing in Tauranga, that's... Um, you know that to be commended and uh, well done. Thanks. Well, it's good to chat, and you know, definitely, I think, I guess, from the company's perspective, I mean, we've we've always probably been, I think, a uniquely New Zealand proposition. Really, at the end of the day, um, you know, we are the product's been sort of born and bred here, and and so it does represent a, a lot of what comes out of New Zealand and, and what we've tried to do is also build on that and integrate that into the brand as well and the way that we communicate to people so they kind of also, you know, um, see that value in it. And you can certainly get a sense that um, that's increasingly kind of useful um, from a commercial standpoint. And it takes businesses like yours to to make that decision, to put a, a Kiwi into the user guide, you know, the... The Danish got good at design and made sure that they were communicating that to the rest of the world yeah. with their interfaces. And I think that's the opportunity for New Zealand too, is integrate our Kiwiness just the way you have with your ambassadors. So we know, you know, look at Owen Boynton, he's, he's got his gun, uh, yeah. he's got his bike. And yeah, it's when, a, you, when you, you know, obviously to the guys like we had this, you know, this new higher powered one that we've been working on, the FRX1. And I said, look, I don't really want some monkey in a motocross suit. And we had this guy down south who's a shepherd and he was in his, like, stubbies. And I said, That's a, he's the guy, uh, you know, old Potter. Um, you know, he's that's the sort of – and people love it, eh, because it's just, it's just different. It's it's probably the same reason why people like something like Fly the Concords in, in the US because it, it's just a little bit um, – you know, it, it's definitely different to what they're used to getting served up. I mean, they, they it's a lot of the stuff gets very formulaic. So exactly, you know. and you're you're making it different, but in a way that's true to New Zealand. Yeah. So you're evolving the classic Kiwi bloke story, if you like, to actually include technology. That that technology is not something that we shy away from because we're Kiwis and we're down on the farm. It's actually integrated in wearing stubbies and going hunting. It's all part of the same thing. It's now just done on electric bikes because that's part of our new Kiwi culture. Yeah, exactly. Hey, look, really appreciated our chat, uh, Timothy, and uh, thank you for being so generous with your time. And I'm sure the, the audience is going to love uh, to get into the, the details on this. <laughs> this will go out to our 1,500 manufacturers as well. So I'm, I'm sure that this is going to inspire um, their own journey as well. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. You are welcome. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade and we'll see you on the next episode.